name is Eric Myers. I'll be talking to you about some research I did over the last few semesters on the wind belt generator and some other uh, energy sources that use wind. The goals of my research were to recreate the original prototype of the wind belt, uh, to maximize its output voltage, and to design an improved version of the wind belt, possibly from that information. Sean Frame was the guy who invented the wind belt, and he caught the attention of Popular Science magazine, and they did an article about it back in 2007. It, the design is really simple. It, it consists of a frame and a belt under some tension. You have a magnet on the on the coil and some, you know, I mean on the ribbon and some coil of wire. This is a picture of it in motion. So you see the little blurry section there off to the left is the belt moving. And then you have the magnet there in between those two coils of wire. It operates from about 4 miles an hour to uh, 14 miles an hour and outputs about 40 milliwatts per device. It cost us about $20 to make one of these. Your uh, alternative would be like a small wind turbine, which operates between 15 to 35 miles an hour and outputs 400 watts at 28 miles an hour, but it costs $725 for one of those small ones. Also, if you look at the uh, you know, the average wind speeds across the United States, we have a pretty decent uh, wind corridor throughout the Great Plains, but here in East Texas, the wind speeds are really too low for, uh, for wind turbines, at least big wind turbines. It averages around um, five meters per second, or actually it would be about 11 miles an hour. So another reason why you wouldn't really want to use wind turbines. The, j the engine that powers the wind belt is flutter, and I'll read you the definition here on the screen. Uh, flutter is a self-starting and potentially destructive vibration where aerodynamic forces on an object coupled with the structure's natural motor vibration to produce rapid periodic motion. I think most of you have seen uh, pictures or videos of the Comanero's bridge. That was aerodynamic flutter in, in its destructive mode. We can also use it. We can also harness the energy. One of the things that I have to calculate when I'm trying to find the output voltage is how strong the magnet is. As you all know, when you have a magnet, you have the field lines that emanate from the north side of the magnet and wrap around to the south side of the magnet, as I've shown here. And for a dipole, the magnetic field is given by this expression here, where V is a magnetic field, M is the dipole moment, and R is the distance from the magnet. If I orient the magnet so that the, the moment points along the z-axis and I'm measuring at some point also along the z-axis, I have this expression. And it, it simplifies down to this one here. I still need to find what m is, that magnetic moment. So I take a magnetometer and I measure the magnetic field at various distances from the magnet. And it gives me a plot something like this here. And as you know, the magnetic field should drop off as an inverse cube relationship. So let's find out if that really is an inverse cube relationship there. I take this and I, I set it up as a general equation of a line where uh, V is the Y. This term in the parentheses is the slope. The X is 1 over Z cubed and the Y intercept is 0. If I plot the magnetic field versus the inverse distance cube, you get this line here, and it has a slope of 2.35 times 10 to the negative 4 millitesla centimeter cube. So remember that term in the parentheses is, is the slope, so I can just take that and solve for the magnetic moment. Once I've converted my units, everything gives me a magnetic moment of 1.5 ampmeters squared. Okay, now I can go on to calculate my output voltage. Again, I've oriented my magnet uh, so that the moment is pointing along the z-axis, and I lay my coil down in the x-y plane and move the magnet like this. There are certain natural modes of vibration for the, for the wind belt, and one of them is this where the magnet is actually moving vertically. My field lines would emanate out from the magnet, and as it moved, it would cut through the coil like this. At the high end, I have about seven lines that are cutting through the coil, and at the lower end, I have nine. Of course, 
the number of these lines is just a representation of the field strength at those areas. I take that and use Faraday's law to find the flux, which says the flux is equal to the integral of the magnetic field dotted into the area. And then once I found the flux, I take the negative time derivative of that to find the MF or the voltage output. So this case that I've shown you here, I can use uh, cylindrical symmetry, which gives me all of this information here. I can use uh, cylindrical symmetry, my dA is this rho dot phi d phi, um, sorry d rho, and uh, my dA is along the z-axis. So I take the dot product of v dot z and plug that into the integral, along with making all those substitutions since it's cylindrical coordinates. So there's my, there's my integral, and you notice there's no dependence on phi, so I can just take that out of the integral. It gives me this term here, this 2 pi term. I make a u substitution, and it gives me this right here. So I can go ahead and form, perform that integral and evaluate it at the upper and lower limits. And then I simplify, and it gives me that expression here. Now I have to take that and take the ne negative time derivative, as I show here. That gives me this final expression. Once I plot this, it gives me this nice sinusoidal uh, curve here, which is my, this is my actual output voltage. Another one of the natural modes of vibration is where the magnet is actually rotating. I won't actually show you all the steps, but it's the same, same process. You take the integral, then take the negative time derivative of that. The field lines are cutting through it, the coil like this, and it gives us that expression there on the bottom. If I plot them side by side, I get something that looks like this. So you can see that the vertical motion is definitely a much greater amplitude than this rotation one. And summarizing all the, the natural modes of vibration that we found, the vertical one there was a really good output. Um, the rotational one was fair. Of course, if you flip the, the magnetic moment so that it's pointing in along in the, the XY plane, you get absolutely nothing. And then when it's uh, moving vertically and rotating at the same time, then the output waveform is chaotic. But the best outcome that we found was this one here, where the magnet is moving in the XY plane and the moment is still oriented along the Z-axis. Uh, Jean Frain actually beat us to the final design. We were actually trying to work on this theory, and uh, he, his original one gives you outputs if you adjust it properly, gives you that output where it's moving in the vertical direction, but his new design gives you this one here where it's moving in the plane. So, anyway, did that kind of fast, but is there any questions? Questions? Yes, sir. How many of those do you need to put together to get a reasonable voltage output, like to power up something? Well, if you if you just want to power a light, just one device will work as long as you know the wind speed is high enough. Um, you generally have to have about four miles an hour, five miles an hour to get them started fluttering, and then you can usually power an LED with just one device. Uh, of course, if you if you wanted to power something larger than just a simple light, then you would have to uh, you know attach a few of them together, but probably. I don't know, it depends on what you're trying to power though. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, how heavy is that device? Can we put them on the kite and then put them on the Well, it, it, it kind of depends on the material that you want to use. The one, like we just used wood and uh, mylar, which is a kite making material. And, and so it was, it was relatively light. You couldn't you couldn't run them on, up on a kite. But if you made them small enough, you probably, uh, you could put them, you could make it airborne if you wanted to. Anything else? How much does the strength of the magnet affect your uh, output? Very significantly. Yeah, um, <coughs> if you go, you mind if I go back that time? Go. Okay. Let's go back. Okay, that's, that's good enough. Okay. You see, well, and this, this is kind of, this is still kind of hiding some information. I want to go back to the my expression for the magnetic field strength. All right, here it is. 
All right, as you can see, that, that M, it, it's through, you know, goes through throughout your equation, so it definitely has a, a pretty large effect on, on the output of your, of your device. You definitely want a stronger magnet, the stronger the better. So how strong is the one you're using right now? It has a magnetic moment of a, about 1.05. Now, there are, there are multiple ways of calculating that magnetic moment. It, it's actually, like, the, the three different methods that I tried, we, we got a magnetic moment of the 1.5 that I showed you, um, and then there were there were several other methods that gave you slightly lower. We we took the average um, when I was when I was doing these calculations. Took the average. So there's the full force <coughs> method. Um, this one where you measure it directly with the magnetometer. Do you remember what the pull force was for that magnet? About eight pounds or five pounds? I, or I don't remember off okay. the top of my head. Any other questions? Okay. Let's thank the author.